No, no, in blow. Not, not like, not like fresh uh, stuff on a pillow. Let's say. All right, so, and I should have took a picture of this because I didn't know at first. I don't know how to take pictures of fluorescent colors, and they come out weird on the camera nice because your eye, it would be like bright yellow, and I take a picture of it, it'd be this kind of pale white. And I'm like, no, people need to see what I'm seeing. All right, so I'm out, I'm doing this, and so suddenly one night I'm sick, and my wife is gone. And this is when I always turn into mad sick because I'm like, okay, I can do the things that she did not want me to do. I go out and I go to the trees that I know has beetles on them. And the beetles have laid eggs and the larvae are in the oocysts eating the adelgids, okay? And I shine this light and there's four colors. Blue, chartreuse, yellow, green, yellow, Bright orange is the predator group. Green, chartreuse green is a squished adelgid. Huh? Oh, I put it's there. It is. I'm not getting good reading. Oh yeah, yeah. Here, it's it's. I took it off because I didn't want people. Okay, here. So I'll back up. All right. So anyway, long story short, I take that I take that ultraviolet light and I go. Of course, I go out to the hemlock. And this, and this hemlock, and I don't know what happened to that little foam piece. I found it. Joe oh, found good. it. Joe Thank, is off. Yeah. I go out to this tree in, in March. This is March 11th, same day as the earthquake in Japan. And I look on the, on the underside of this tree, and it glows all these different colors. So I take a clipping, and I go in, and the first, there's ovisacs, but these ovisacs are glowing orange. So I touch it with a pin, and a Laracobius larvae comes popping out. They're like a little ladybug larvae. It's in there chewing. And I'm like, no way. So this thing goes out onto a needle. It sits there for a minute. It goes back in. So I go down the limb a little further. Here's another ovisac, and it's orange. And I touch it again. Larva pops out again. And suddenly I'm like, no way. So long story short, you guys, if you have hemlocks or you know people that need help with hemlocks, during certain times, just starting to happen now because the adelgid has just broken diapause, but you can take an ultraviolet light and go out under hemlocks that have these predators where we live now, and I can show you them eating because when they start damaging the adelgids, the adelgids glow. There's some kind of terpene or some kind of pinene, you know what I mean, some ring structure that glows, and if you think about it, I'll give you my take on this as a scientist, is back millions of years ago when the Earth's atmosphere was much less, it was mainly conifers. And if you think about conifers, conifers go up to the tree line because they're UV resistant. They can tolerate ultraviolet way more than deciduous trees because of their needles. And that's how they, they evolved in the Earth in that real hard ultraviolet light. And then they gradually shifted the climate to allow these other things to come in. So suddenly, I start getting serious about this now, man. <laughs> All right, so I go out now, when I go to Seattle, I got this, now this, oh, it, yeah, this, oh, I, I don't, it doesn't really matter, okay, I just wanted to show you that it works, there we go. So this is 13 watt, the actual best thing to use is just a regular hippie black light that you can buy at CVS or Walmart or wherever you buy hippie black, a regular just fluorescent black light works great. So the other thing that I did, you see, you know, you, see, you have ten of floors. You can see where I slobbered on myself here today. So this is the kind of stuff. So this is the kind. I mean, so what I want to tell you guys is, we just started in on this. I'll bet you some other stuff out there in that garden glows at night, and we haven't taken the time yet to figure that out. But wouldn't that be a cool thing if you could just go through and wand a bunch of stuff and say, I can now. Here's what I can do. I took this idea and I gave it to the buddy of mine that I used to be in a band with, all right, a guitar player, because I'm like, I'm poking the box here. I'm going to drop this into this guy's brain and see what comes burping back out, right? So I give it to him, and he thinks, and the next day I get this, this link to him, a 100-watt ultraviolet stage wash. You know, for stages, apparently I didn't realize this, but they use ultraviolet all the time. And so we could put one of those under a tree with a high-res camera when the predators are active as the larva stage and, and estimate the predation where before, one of the reasons I have such a glorious hump like Mr. Burns is because I'm always under the scope looking at this stuff. 
And so this turns out to be a way to do this that's non-invasive. You can just count the orange, you know, I mean, hey. And so this, I just discovered this last March. The Forest Service is just now believing me because of all the other stuff that I've told them that has come true where they used to, you know, go, okay, we're going to have to wait and get independent verification because that guy is crazy, <laughs> right? But I'm crazy in a good way, all right? So anyway, you can go, you can go to, um, just go to a pet store. These are $8.95 or maybe $11.95. They're pet urine detectors. Or if you want to go to BioClip, the, the wavelength on these is 395 nanometers. So when I first did this, I had this spy pen that was the exact right wavelength. I ordered black lights on the web and I'd get them in and put them on and they wouldn't work because they were the wrong wavelength. It's got to be right around 395. I mean, this is, this is what I've, I bought four UV things that did not work before I got, I finally realized I went to BioQuip and I'm like, I need 395, bam, get it. The ones at the pet stores are, are this wavelength too. Yeah, so anyway, at some point in time when we do the um, more of the adelgid stuff, okay. Now what I'm going to do here is I just want to walk through this real quick and tell you guys about. Well, I want to check and see if people are into it because we have a nice infection of adelgid. Okay. It's a little bit of a walk and I wonder if people want to do that when she's talking about the growth. Let's go out there. Will we see, see anything if we don't have, we will have some natural predation anyways, right? Right. Should I do slideshow on this, or will it? Do you want to now? Well, or do you just want to advance it? Well, yeah, I just want to advance it. See, it's okay, not doing it. I'll just have a static shot, and then you can help me advance, and then I will advance you. Okay. Just say go. No. All right, so go. Boom. See if it'll do it. Yeah. There we go. Okay, now this is a dated PowerPoint, but the main point is you guys know that here's your, your hemlock distribution. It goes all the way out here. It also, there's a couple outliers in my home state of Missouri. There's a county, McDowell County down here that has naturalized hemlock populations. So what happened over time when the continent was cooler, these hemlocks went all the way here, and what's been happening is they've been slowly retreating north as the climate gets warmer. And so in 1950, in Richmond, Virginia, some people brought in weeping hemlocks from Japan that had this adelgid, okay? The adelgid is also native to our own country. Go to the next slide, all right? So it was first identified in the 50s, about 54. It's been really, you know, cranking along at, uh, you know, nearly 10 miles a year. It's, it's expanding exponentially. So over half the hemlock range. For those of you, here is an electron micrograph of an adelgid. It's basically an aphid and it's burgundy colored. It looks like a wine. You know, it's that dark red color. Right now, they've broken diapause and you have second instars, so they're puffing up with this little, with your wool there, okay? Yes, when you get, okay, now here's where I did the who, what, when, where, why, and how that nobody had done in the Forest Service. What level of these adelgids hurts a tree and what level doesn't? Because all they were thinking about was either in absolute terms, either a tree had all these or they wanted nothing. And I'm like, I'm going back to our farmscaping stuff, right? So now I'm dropped into a group of foresters and they think that I am a lunatic. So I'm right back in where I was with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture in a way, at least at first, okay? And so these feed at the base of the needles. When you get more than 45% of the, of the needles on a tree infested, the respiration drops to 5%. So there's our threshold. All we got to do is drop the number of adelgids on a tree below 45%, and if the predators are there, they will do this, okay? So here's what started to happen. I started going to Seattle uh, as part of a dissertation. I was on the PhD committee of a guy named David Mazel that did all the original releases on this, and I wanted to get involved in this, so I asked to be put on his committee and they foolishly put me on the committee, all right? So the next thing I did was call Dave up and say, I'm not your average committee member. I said, I, think of something that I can do to help you and I will do it. So he called me back and he said, how about going to Seattle with me and collecting these bugs? That was the best thing, you know, he, he asked the right question. 
So what started happening, we get out to Seattle and the place that we want to collect is the Washington Park Arboretum. For any of you that have been to Seattle, it's a beautiful big arboretum. In that arboretum are about 40 eastern hemlocks, ranging from anywhere from being 20 years old to over 80 years old. They're right next to western hemlocks. They both have adelgids on them and they both have these beetles. And so suddenly, I'm like, this says it all. And I go to the collections manager, a guy named Randall Cunningham, and I say, do you guys treat your trees for, for hemlock woolly adelgid or do you treat them for pests? And he pulls me aside and he goes, we don't have enough money to mow. Anything that grows here is growing here because it made it, okay? So suddenly, I knew something was up. I'm using my farmscaping stuff now with alternate hosts and all this and I'm seeing, you know what I mean, I'm seeing Carolina, Western and Eastern hemlocks all in Seattle, all growing fine. Go on to the next slide here. Okay, so what happened, about 2006, the gene jockeys got in here and I'm sitting in a meeting, this was actually good, they did something really good. They did DNA analysis and they proved scientifically that there are at least three strains of the adelgid and one of them's native to our own country. So where's that buzzer? Eh, 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 eh. All right. When this guy's talk went off, I'm sitting in there and I almost wet myself because I realized if this, if Western U.S., then what we're looking at there is a stable system that we have in our own country. But nobody knew that, and people questioned it at first. So what happened was, we have this own winter predator, and we also have a summer predator named Skimnus coniferarum that I helped to identify that we just got through the environmental assessment on, and about a month ago got approval for it. But it's the summer predator, because the adelgid has two generations, right? So what, what's one of our farmscaping principles? Bracketing, all right? We had this one. This beetle by itself will control the adelgid in our area because we're up high. Even in CeeLo, this beetle will control it because you only have about 25 eggs per ovisac. If you get down into this area where it's warmer, the adelgids have 100 eggs per ovisac and you need that summer predator. So we were lucky. Summer predator places like along the river when the river is off. Yes, exactly. Or up on ridges, like up on Horse Ridge and all that. Because the winter predator needs that dog. Right. Yes. And so we did get the Japanese strain of adelgid, and there is a Chinese strain, and for 20 years we didn't know it, and people were going to Japan and China and, you know, doing all this stuff, and that was all well and good because that's what we knew. But this part of this is teamwork was to figure all this out, right? So let's go on to the... So what we found out really quickly, go on to the next one, was... The first week that I was in Seattle, we worked until 11 o'clock every night and we dissected 1,200 of those little egg sacs. 600 of them had a Laracobius egg or larvae in them. And another, so that's 50%, and another 45% were disturbed. Okay, so by disturbed, it was an ovisac that had been eaten. And there might be a Laracobius right next to it, but as a scientist, I could not, the scientist won't let you say that it went there until I did this UV stuff and there's orange poop in there now. <laughs> Boom! I got him! All right? All right. So this is great, man. This is like setting it up, you know, just setting it up. So what happened is everybody thought that the western trees were resistant. They're not resistant. They have a little predator in this. And it, it turns out if you caged exclusion these to keep these predators out, western hemlocks die as fast as easterns. So it's obviously they're not. They're not resistant, okay? Now, there's a bunch of people, yeah, okay? So the first thing we started finding were hemlocks that were planted in 1947. Later on, I went to the Calvary graveyard right above the University of Washington. In 1900, they planted 18 eastern hemlocks that are this big around, beautiful, with adelgids, and, and I go in there and catch beetles, and I'm like, ha, 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 here it is, okay? So what we believe, and this is becoming more and more confirmed, is that these Eastern and Carolina hemlocks are benefiting from these predators that they're in that natural system. And so that meant to us, if we bring those back here, it's gonna work, okay? So let's